We are in an unprecedented, historic time in the history of our country, certainly, but all over the world. There are more displaced people now than at any time in, in recorded history. At the core of this issue are people, and there are families and individuals and children who are finding themselves displaced. Covenant World Relief is the historic way that the Covenant responds to human tragedy around the world. Covenant World Relief works with local partners, so the people that are doing the work of Covenant World Relief on the ground are the people that know the culture, that know the people, and have relationships. There's a correlation of immediate relief and building sustainable structures for the future. Building those long-term partnerships helps the community to be sustainable in their efforts. We in the church have an opportunity to reach out with the love of Christ to people who are in desperate situations, to people who are made in the image of God. I'd like to invite you to, to join Covenant World Relief in the ministry that God has provided to us. We get to see people transformed and we get to be transformed in the process. Won't you join us in this process of transformation? For me, that was a relatively new experience. I hadn't heard about this denomination before, but it has become one of the great blessings of my life. Rana, my wife, and the Covenant Church. Because I found a church that was really passionate about mission. You know, so passionate about reaching out and caring for others that in 1885, when this this group was forming together, they had some arguments. They had some disagreements. And you know what they said? They said, because of our passion for mission, let's agree to disagree on some of these issues so that together we can reach out and participate in God's mission in the world. And I've learned that the Covenant Church really understands that the church, whether it's the local church or our, our family of 850 churches, recognizes that we are not the most important. The, the church itself exists for the world. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for the world. And it's been great to be a part of this. So within six months of getting married in 1982, Ron and I went to Japan as short-term missionaries. We thought, at least, those two years. It was a wonderful experience. God changed me in so many ways. We got to see so many wonderful things that he was doing in Japan. So wonderful that 26 years later, we came back from Japan. And I began serving with Covenant World Relief. Now, 10 years before that, we were uh, serving as the regional coordinators for Asia for the mission of the Covenant Church. So Covenant World Relief is now part of what we call Serve Globally. It's the international mission outreach of the Covenant Church. We are one part of that. <laughs> Covenant World Relief is the humanitarian aid ministry of the Covenant Church. Covenant World Relief sometimes is seen as, as just mainly focusing on disaster. Why? Because disasters are such a big part of the news and because we have relief in our name. And for sure, Covenant World Relief is part of relief. Right now in Venezuela, you may have heard that there are thousands of thousands of Venezuelans who are fleeing. That country, you know, we've been hearing a lot about this caravan, which is of another serious situation. But in Venezuela, it is a far more desperate situation. And you know, being part of this covenant family, there's a covenant church in Colombia. There's a covenant church in Ecuador. You know, with covenant, partnering with Covenant World Relief, the, these two churches are reaching out to these Venezuelan refugees who are coming into their country, and we get to be a part of that. But we never believe that relief is the final step. Because it's part of who we are as followers of Jesus to believe that God is all about transformation. The transformation process is long-term. Each one of us, is a work in process. 
If you could stand up here, you could talk about the first time you met Jesus and all the years in between, or maybe it's been more recent, but this, this is a long process that God is changing us, and we believe that we want to be a part of his long-term transformation, and so there is relief, there's recovery, and then what we spend most of our time on in the world is transformational community development. One of the greatest humanitarian crises in the world right now is in Yemen, don't hear a lot about it, although recently it's been getting more news. Do you know that there was, uh, as of last year, more than a million people had contracted cholera? The largest cholera outbreak in recorded human history. Because of the war and because of the warring parties, humanitarian aid has been blocked. People are hungry. They can't get water. Fortunately, we've been able to work with that other organization called World Relief, and we've been able to respond to this humanitarian crisis. The Syrian crisis, right now, Syria has the largest number of refugees in the world. And through another partner in Lebanon, we're able to respond to the refugees that have crossed the border. I was just there this earlier this year, and we were within a half hour of the Syrian border. 1.5 million Syrians in this little country of Lebanon that has a population of 4 million. Can you imagine if we had that proportion of refugees in our country? We are able to be a part of caring for these desperate refugees who have, flown, who have fled from Syria. Friday, I'll be going to Ecuador you know, and I'm really excited to go to the coast. Do you remember just a couple years ago there was an earthquake in Ecuador? Most of the world has forgotten it. I'll tell you, the people there haven't forgotten it. The destruction was incredible. And they are still working. And they will be working for years with the local community to help them recover and rebuild their lives. And they are all about long-term transformation. And we get to be a part of that as well. So Covenant World Relief is currently at work in 26 countries with 30 partners doing more than 100 programs. For now, I'd like to read a passage that if you've grown up in the church, you've, you've heard this before. But today I want you to hear it afresh. It's from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. You know, when this, in this story, we hear from a widow, sometimes, at least for me, but I think perhaps others of us in the U.S., when we think of widow, we think of an old person. The fact that she still has sons living with her probably means that she's not an old person. But she is a desperate woman. Do you know widows, even today, in much of the world, widows are among the most vulnerable people. Do you know in many countries, when the husband dies, the woman is not able to, in, to take the property. She's forced out of the house. Sometimes she doesn't even get to take her children. This woman comes to the prophet and in desperation saying, I'm going to lose my sons. Why? My husband has left us with a debt. 
Now, he was a great man of God, but we were in debt. And the, 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 the people are going to come and take my sons. And the prophet Elisha, his response was the most natural one, and I believe, I would hope, every person in this room would have the same response. His, his response is, what can I do to help you? When you see that level of desperation, the natural human response is, what can I do to help? But then he asks the second question, which goes beyond what we usually ask. And it's the second question that's up on the screen. It is, what do you have in your house? No, no, I just told you I'm going to lose my sons. I've got a debt. And he says, what do you have in your house? And of course, her response is, Basically, I haven't got anything, just a little bit of oil. Now, the prophet Elisha never went to, probably doesn't have a degree, an advanced degree in community development or anything like that. But this prophet was a man of God, and this prophet knows how our God works. And so he asked the question, recognizing that even though she may think she has nothing, <laughs> she's got a lot. What are other things and go ahead and just shout out. What a, she, she has more than just a little oil. What does this woman have? A house? Family? She's got sons, right? There's one other really important thing. Anybody saying, what, who's out around her house? Neighbors. Neighbors, friends, right? Doesn't that kind of, that last one kind of determine how much oil she ends up getting? What if she were just this mean person who had no friends? And the prophet said, go out and get your jars. And their neighbor's going, I'm not giving you my jar. Now we know that this woman probably had a lot of friends. Why do we know that? Because at the very end of the passage, when the oil finally stops flowing and she's just overwhelmed with, wow, we just started off with a little oil and look what we've got. The jars just kept coming and coming and coming. And when she reports to the prophet, he says, good, pay off your debt. What? The whole debt is wiped clean. It doesn't stop there. He says, now live on what's left over. She had a lot of jars. This is the God that we serve. The God that we serve, of course, there are miraculous things like this that happen, not just in the Bible, but at all times. But he starts with what we have. Do you remember Moses standing in front of Yahweh in early part of Exodus, the end of chapter 3, beginning of 4. And Yahweh is, is explaining that he wants Moses to help lead the children of Israel out of slavery. And Moses is really going, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And Yahweh then finally says, ask Moses a question. Remember the question he asked? It's very similar to what do you have in your house? What do you have in your hand? Moses goes, I've got a stick. Now, if you're more spiritual, you say staff. <laughs> but it was a stick. That's all it was. You remember, God told him to throw it down. It turned into a snake. And, well, he was very shocked. But God said, now, you've got that stick. I'm going to be with you. Now, that stick ended up drawing water from a rock, dividing the Red Sea, this is the God we serve. He takes what we have and he uses it for his glory and kingdom. What about the New Testament? Of course, one of the most famous stories in the Bible, it's in all four Gospels. Jesus has been sharing the word and he notices the people are hungry and it's thousands of people. And he says, let's feed them. And his followers say, no way, this is impossible. Somebody says something about there's one lunch with some loaves and fish and Jesus, what was Jesus' question? How many loaves do you have? What? <laughs> it's just one lunch. It's just a few loaves. But Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah. He could have just said, we're starting from scratch here. <laughs> we don't need anything. Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? And he started with those loaves and he fed all those people. This is the God we serve. Do you know there's an organization in India called the Hindustani Covenant Church and they've been interested in water for, you know, because India is, is either flooding or most of the time there's famine. 
And there's so many people that lack access to water. And so since the 60s, they've been engaged in, in uh, seeking to provide water for people who are in need. This is Covenant World Relief's largest partner. In the 80s, UNICEF went to them. And now there was an engineer from Sweden. He was a covenant missionary from Sweden who was there. And UNICEF talked to him and the rest of the group and said, you guys are really doing good things in the area of water. And we like this pump that you've made, but we want you to improve it. And so would you spend the next couple of years improving it? And then in the mid-80s, around 1986, UNICEF actually dedicated that pump as the India Mark II Deep Well Hand Pump. It's a deep well. It's for the deeper, it's for when the water table is low in those places. It's a long story. There's a video on our website. Do you know that that pump, from this little church that had less than 1,000 members in the whole denomination, in this little place from Solapur, in Solapur in India, that pump is now the largest selling deep well hand pump in the world. They're all over the place. You'll see some pictures, I believe, today, but you can see them on our website. I go all over Africa, in Haiti, in other, in other parts of Asia. If you look closely, it's the India, Mark II or Mark III, sometimes even Mark IV, there's been some changes. But it comes from this little church. God took what they had, and look what he's done in multiplying it. This is the God we serve. Now, we work with a lot of partners around the world who really get this, because a lot of these partners don't have a lot of resources. Covenant World Relief is not a huge organization. We're thankful that it's, Covenant World Relief is made up of, of this family of covenant churches. The churches give, individuals give, and we're able to participate. But these organizations know that they, whatever they have, God is going to use. And they then also know that whatever's in the community. So, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your community? We work with an organization that really, under, several that really understand leadership. Leaders. You know, in Goma, Congo, which is right on the Rwanda border, we're engaged with an organization called HOLD, Humanitarian Organization for Lasting Development. Modestine on the right is an amazing young woman who is the director. And in starting this organization to reach out to young women who, because of rape or some other reason, have given birth to children before marriage and are shamed by the community. She's now working with this, and she did not look outside for leaders. She found them in the community. So that even one young woman, Desange, who herself had a child in her late teens and became, came to the program in desperation and was completely transformed in her early 20s now, she is one of the leaders. And she is bringing hope to her community. She was so proud. She looks like she's being a model here. She, she actually went through the sewing course and she was showing off this dress that she had made. And, and she was announcing that she was about to get married and she was making her wedding dress and the suit for her husband. <laughs> this young Desage, what do you have in your house? We have future leaders. And when I was there this last, uh, earlier this year, these young women, some of them who've only been in the program for a few months, were going out to high school. It was actually Valentine's Day. This photo was taken on February 14th of this year. And they went out to the high school and they had a message to the girls, be ready, the guys are going to try to get you in bed. And this is what you can do to protect yourselves. Do you know that this area, this eastern part of Congo is called the gender-based violence capital of the world or the rape capital of the world. And these young women who themselves have experienced great shame but have also are in the process of transformation are now helping to change the lives of others. We have an organization that understands the importance of personal experience. In India, the, the organization I just mentioned, the Hindustani Covenant Church, they there was this kind of God-ordained meeting with Gongabai. Gongabai was a commercial sex worker in Pune. And they were able to counsel her and bring her out, and she was transformed. And they, they realized, wow, look at this ministry that lies before us. What are we going to do to be able to move forward with this? Most of the leaders at that time, and even now, they're still mostly men. They're working at getting more women. But they thought, we can't go into that community. 
Who's going to lead it? Guess who became the leader? Gungabai. She's the one with experience. She's the one with the relationships. And then there's Panna with the yellow scarf. When they recognized that they needed to focus on children as well, sometimes the younger children are just put under the bed while the mother does her job. They wanted a safe place, a place for children to be able to receive an education, to be loved and cared for. And Panna, who lived in the community, helped them find the place where they could do this. And they have, over time, this ministry has grown to the place where there was a campaign some years ago in this denomination called Break the Chains. And those funds were, helped, were used to help build the Home of Hope, which now is even bigger than this. I don't have the most recent picture. There's a second story where women can come and women can be removed from that red light district. They can, they can receive counseling. They can be part of the worship. They can receive vocational training. And one of the things that they are doing is they started a business of making communion wafers. These women who used to sell their bodies, they say, we used to sell our bodies, now we have the privilege of making the body of Christ. In South Africa, we were working with an organization called Zimele Watu. This organization just inspires me every time I go. Because they really believe in whole life transformation. Every area of life being transformed. And they're working with Zulu women. This is the largest black African group in South Africa. And these are women who, because of apartheid, have been oppressed. But you know, even more because of, of their cultural situation. They are oppressed. They are, very few of them, ha the middle-aged ones and older hardly have any education at all. Basically, the message is, you're valuable only for the children that you bear and for taking care of the house, and that's it. But through this organization, these women have been transformed. They, they join together, they encourage one another, they start small businesses together. And when I was visiting the, a, a community that was really struggling in, in the area of water, these women, they said, these women are part of our group. And they're walking down. And I, I said, would you ask them if I can take a photo? So I took their photo, but you, I don't think they were very happy with me. because. But anyway, I took their photo. <laughs> and the leader said, you probably think they're just carrying water to their house. And I said, yeah, that's what I think. No, these women are carrying water to the houses where people, where they cannot get their own water. They actually went into this house where the, the father was uh, physically ill, was not able to get out of his chair. The mother had to go some distance away to work at a very low-paying job. And so they came, and they cleaned the yard. They did laundry. They cooked. They carried water. These are women who themselves have been transformed, but to me, that's just the very first stage of transformation. Real transformation comes when we realize what God has done for us and we want to see that transformation in the lives of others. And as we're leaving, we're passing by and they said, that's widow so-and-so. And I said, tell me about her. They said, well, she lived on the edge of town and, 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 and she was constantly getting robbed because she's in an unsafe area. Again, a widow who's very vulnerable, right? And you know, this group of women said, we're gonna, we're gonna address this. And so they said to her, we're gonna build you a house in the middle of the community where you'll be safer. And so I saw that, and that was a couple years ago, and then this last year I came back, and I got to see this woman, who's in her new house now, praising God the whole time. She just, we were trying to talk, and she just would not stop praising God. <laughs> because she had a house with a latrine in the middle of the community. These women had done it themselves. They didn't hire somebody to do it. They built the house for her. These are transformed women. What do you have? We have people in our community who bring about transformation. You know, I think a lo most people would say, yeah, youth are an asset. Youth are, you know, a good thing to have. It was great seeing the, the kids up here this morning. But there's an organization in Monterrey, Mexico that has taken it to a whole different level. They live in a community that a few years ago, I wasn't even allowed to go because it was too dangerous. 
It's a community where drug cartels were present, where a lot of families have experienced different kinds of violence. And they basically saw this as a community of future leaders. <laughs> and so they said, we're going we're to focus on children, and, we're gonna, and as these children grow up, we're going to develop them as leaders. And when I was there, again, I was just, I was just there last month, when they, sh when they come together as full-time, part-time, and volunteers, when the it's 20-some people, you ask how many people are from this community, how many people have been raised up through this organization, virtually everybody raises their hand. It's not just that they're, they're benefiting the youth. The youth are becoming the leaders of the organization. What do you have in your community? We've got youth. You know, sometimes when you work with the poor, whether it's in the United States or in a country with abject poverty, we just assume that poor people need our help and our money. But there's an organization in Kenya called Jito Keze. And Jito Keze forms especially women into groups and says to them, we're going to start by saving a little bit. And they say, oh, we don't have much to save. That'd be too hard. But over time, they begin to save a little bit. And they see how this little bit comes into uh, a, a little pool of funds. And they begin borrowing to start small businesses. And they actually, in this process, they're also working together and farming together and learning techniques and actually doing much better so that they can now feed their families, send their kids to schools to the point that the men are, had become envious and the men have started their own savings groups as well. This is one, what do you have in your community? Labor. Sometimes we, and I admit that this is the way I was raised, my father was one of the most generous people that I know. He would give anything and do anything for anyone and he loved doing things, but he did things to a fault. He would always want to do things for people. You know that growing up, I got a, I won't, well, I'll just tell you, my first car was a 1951, and it was a beater then, but we got it for $32. My dad fixed it up. It would constantly break down. My dad would constantly fix it. I would say, can you, can you show me? And he goes, no, no, I'll just do it for you. So then that's the way it went on with my cars. My dad would take care of that. But then my dad died. <laughs> and where, I'm, where am I left? Not able to fix cars, right? <laughs> but my dad loved doing it. He loved to be able to help people. But he robbed me of the opportunity <laughs> of learning how to fix cars, right? In, in Honduras, there is an organization called Cose Predil, and they really understand, when they go into communities, what they see is a labor force in the community. And they do water systems, and these are not just drilling a little well and have people walk for miles to get water. This is an organization that believes that people should have water in their community so that they don't have to go great distances. And these when, before they ever do it, they organize the community, and the community commits to doing virtually all the labor except for the very most difficult engineering part, which comes from the local context. It's not outsiders coming in. And they're so proud of what they do. So when I got to go to the celebration in this Los Limones community, I was so thankful. They, they thanked the donors. We aren't the only ones. There is another organization that was part of it too. They thanked us, but really what they did was they thanked God. And in their prayer, they said, thank you, God, for what you've allowed us to do. It was their water system. They did it. They built it. This particular woman got up on the stage, and she held up her water clay jar. And, you know, in Honduras, in this area, it's very steep mountains, and because of gravity, we have this thing where you start off with an empty jar going down, right? But because of gravity, you've got that pain of filling up the jar and having to carry it back up again. And she said, I thought this was going to be my lot in life forever, to carry water. But now every house has a sink. Every house has a latrine. And she took that jar, she threw it into the air, and she screamed, 
never again. And it came down with a crash. And here's a piece of it. And I keep this on my desk to remind me of the amazing God that we serve and, and, and the change that he can bring about in communities. What do you have in your house? We've got expertise. In Laos, I was just there a couple weeks ago, there's an organization called Mulberries. In fact, if you look at the little, uh, you have a mini newsletter that you got today. That first article is, is all about Mulberries. This is an organization where the woman, the Lao woman, Komali, who started it, recognized that a lot of the women, the minority groups, the women have been raised in doing silk weaving. And so she took that and she's developed this whole organization that begins with raising cows to get the manure, to help the mulberry bushes grow, to take the mulberry leaves, to feed the, feed the silkworms, to be able to, the silkworms then spin the cocoon and then they take the thread from the cocoons and they, they prepare the thread for dyeing, which I don't have the, the, the slide of, but then they eventually they weave this beautiful material. Taking what is already there, the skill that is there, and it's amazing to see the transformation that's taking place. And finally, the local church. What greater asset to any community than the local church, as we talked about before? There's the Evangelical Covenant Church of Kenya. This pastor on the left, Simon Kamau, Pastor Simon, understands the value. And when I first met him nine years ago, we heard the story. This was a little church of 50, very poor, cinder block church, tin roof building, 240 refugees showed up, coming all the way from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they said, can you help us? You know, humanly speaking, <laughs> if it were me, I would say, can't you see we are a poor little church? We can't do anything for you. You know what Simon, Pastor Simon's response was? Welcome. You're part of us. And yes, there were a lot of organizations like Covenant World Relief and other covenant ministries that also in, got involved. But you know, over this period of time, the amazing thing is that church of 50 is now a church of 700. And the majority of the people in the church are Congolese refugees. Now, unfortunately, this is the one negative side, some of the people in the church said, I don't want these foreigners in our church, and they took off. Fortunately, not everybody. <laughs> and they have a thriving, healthy church because the pastor recognized, this is why we're here. We're here to care and love for people who are hurting. And look what's happened in this town. And now another church has been planted as well. This is the God we serve. Sorry, I didn't show you as they began working with these Congolese children, getting them into schools, helping them learn English, helping them to be able to get jobs, to, to settle into the community, and to get their legal documents so that they are registered with the government living there. This is the God we serve. This is the God who says, whatever you've got, I'm going to use it. So the question for us is, what do you have in your house? And I literally mean this, in, the, in your house where you live. What do you have in your family? What do you have? What has God given you? And then, what do you have in your church? If, if we had the time today for people to come up and talk about expertise and experience and other things that God has gifted them with, we would hear about the, a vast treasury of what God has given. What do you have in your church? And then, what do you have in your community? I don't know much about... Greeley or the wider area around here. But I'll bet that there are a lot of other churches and other organizations who are engaged with bringing about transformation in this community. What a great thing. We can join together with what's already happening there. Even some of the good things that the government is doing. Government doesn't always do good things. But there are some good things. How can we connect? I believe this is the question we need to keep asking God. This is what you've given me. How can I use what you've given me for your kingdom and your glory? Will you open your hands and receive the blessing this morning as you go? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord 
make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Go with God.